Welcome everyone. Planning Commission meeting September 18, 2017. And if you'll please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. meeting to order at 7.30. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I forgot to say that. Go ahead, Bruce. Attendance, please. Okay. Here. Agenda. I make a motion to approve the agenda as a, submitted for uh, September 18, 2017. Second. All those in favor of approving the agenda as submitted <coughs> September 18, 2017, say aye. 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 Opposed? None. The agenda passes. Number five, public comments. Mr. Walsey. Uh, due to the fact that two board members were not present at the last meeting, one being uh, Mr. Fernandez, uh, Commissioner Fernandez, and the other one being Commissioner Kim, I wondered if I could ask you how you would have voted on the, the road issue, the private road and the private drive issue, or ordinance. Well, you know, I wasn't really here for all of the, the discussions on it and all, but I would probably vote in favor. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else? <coughs> Number six, new business items. Number seven, old business items. Master plan, part 10, Goffertson Road, M14, urban service area plan. Mm -hmm. Paul, would you like to start us off, please, and take a review? Sure. So uh, it's been quite some time since we talked about this section. We've been spending our time uh, focusing on the Hamlet area, and as you recall, the same master plan. Both of these were lumped together in the same chapter <coughs> as the uh, special districts chapter. And so um, when I started working with you, these have been split out into two, two separate uh, parts of the ordinance. So we have now kind of worked through the details in the um, Hamlet section, and, and now we're working through the details with uh, the urban service district. We have had some discussion um, I've made a number of changes, and what we put in your packets were both um, a clean copy of, of what we've done, and then uh, <coughs> a, a copy showing the track changes so you can see what, what changes have been made to date. Um, there are quite a number of graphics that are used in the current um, master plan that uh, I will still continue to work on. Um, I, I feel that there's still quite a bit of work to do, but as we're Coming up on a planning commission meeting, and we didn't have any other agenda items. I want to put this in front of you to just really hear some more discussion from the planning commissioners, get some more direction, uh, make sure that we're moving in the right direction. 
obviously, uh, just as we did with the other one, we tried to spend a little more time <coughs> defining this, the area, the planning area, a little more clearly. Um, you know, the history part is what it is. Uh, worked a little bit on updating the development uh, principles and strategies based on the discussions that we've had so far, talking about some ideas about, um, you know, really protecting the existing natural features in the area and using those as buffers, uh, talking about pedestrian connections. Um, I think by and large with a, a development or a, a, a planning area of this size, uh, looking at the different uses, the existing land uses that are there, as well as the planned uses. We talked about having some organizing features to kind of uh, center this around. Um, and in my opinion, I think that connectivity, both vehicular, pedestrian, as well as providing some of those uh, natural features corridors are going to be some of the key elements to um, both preserve some of the existing character uh, and protect that from new development, as well as make that new development more cohesive. Um, so we updated the uh, future land use just a little bit to be more um, reflective of what's going on there, especially that south uh, east corner to show that that's uh, residential as opposed to what was previously called for there. Um, but then there are still a couple pieces like up in the northern part of uh, Godfordson Road where it still shows uh, ROP, um, residential office park, uh, and there clearly commercial uses in that area. And then there are other areas. Um, there's the multifamily districts. There's the URL2. And then um, some other areas that are not developed that also include a uh, residential office park as well as uh, a research and research uh, associated uses. So I would look for feedback from you all on the, the future land use plan as well as any input that you have about um, what you expect to see here. I mean, so. It's a little difficult of a task to take a document and try to <clears throat> rewrite something, especially as wordy and lengthy as this is, um, to try to craft it around the direction that we're going at this point. Um, some of the language that's, that's been added here is, um, I guess, vague and left up to some interpretation. So I think what I've heard is that we really want to kind of hone this in and pinpoint it so that as developers come in, they know what to expect and we know how to guide. So with that said, uh, I would, you know, ask for any feedback that you might have and see if there are any uh, reactions to the changes that I've made or other areas that you want to see uh, changes within the document. I think the intent of taking another look at this, even though a lot of work was put into this language, plenty of language, was to make sure that there weren't any loopholes that the builders could take advantage of, that we would make sure that it was pretty tightly put together, like you said, so even when other developers come in to develop, that there's pretty accurate and fi finite um, parameters for them to develop. You know, are they, you know, and we're, we're looking for the development there to be a first class development. Uh, all the developments that go in there to be first class. We, we won't, you know, the, it's in, in, in the interest of the township to make sure that it's not a hodgepodge thing. So I think that's where we wanted to take a look at this language and make sure that, you know, that we're protected. I guess the question is, um, you know, is the language that you see there consistent with what you want to see? Um, and, and I think one of the most important pieces, you know, obviously we can try to uh, be diligent about making sure that there are buffers and big transitions between a 
existing lower density agriculture residential areas in the district itself. As we've discussed, as soon as there are utilities in this area, there's going to be a lot of pressure uh, to develop this area. And um, I think the most critical component of this is going to be that area that centers around Godfrey Road, and that's already articulated in this language. Um, the, I guess one of the concerns that I have, and I've, I've heard from folks saying, you know, we, we don't want to be another kind of suburban commercial area, similar to some of the, the neighboring communities around here. But I don't know that the language nor the uh, regulations and zoning ordinance necessarily will prohibit that. It may end up being still sprawled, but sprawled on well. Right. Um, and so, you know, there's a discussion of the uh, commercial office, uh, excuse me, commercial park, I believe is what it's called. Sorry, the name of that district is? The CCP. Yes. <coughs> Commercial Commons Park, which, based on the graphics and the language, still seems like it will be kind of a stripped development with some open space within it. And so that's a question. Is that something that you're looking for, or would you look for something that has more of a traditional kind of neighborhood or town feel with blocks and sidewalks? And that kind yeah, I think, you know, in regard to strip malls, you know, there's, there's some pretty nasty examples of strip malls, and then there's some that, you know, and I know some of the board members have looked at some of the other towns and that that have these upscale malls. You know, you might have a clock in the mall, and you have a central place where you, people can sit down with benches and things like that. In other words, the idea was if we're going to have anything of that nature, that it would be upscale. It would, you know, that it would be aesthetically pleasing. And I think that that's, and I think that that doesn't have to be nailed down in language here, I don't think. I think that would be up to the Planning Commission and the Board to steer that, would it not? Yes, um, I, I think that that is true. Um, but then my question would be, functionally, even, even if you do a, a mall of that nature, it's more upscale with a clock or a plaza or something like that. You still end up with the same kind of traffic patterns. You still end up with the same kind of potentially congestion that might be drawn to that area because it's not really connected then to the larger community. So right. we have in this plan, um, you know, multifamily and residential adjacent to the commercial commons park. Um, with a more traditional kind of town design or neighborhood design, you might have some side streets that then would provide the access to these various businesses. So that instead of having everything fronting on Godfordson with multiple curb cuts for every single site that gets developed, you might be able to create a concept wherein we overlay this with a transportation plan first, and then that creates the building block for, for the community that you want to see. So it could be integrated in with the community. Uh, right. They, you know, it, would, it wouldn't look hodgepodge. I could, you know, can't have something like that where they've incorporated the businesses in with the community and that type of thing. Um, you know, where trying to create something like uh, like they have in Florida where, you know, they can walk to the store or so they can, you know, it, it's, it's like a village type or mm -hmm. you know, that type of community. I think if that, that that concept probably would be more desirable than just a flat out strip mall off Gaffey's and you know, and, uh, and it would draw more people because it would become more of a destination as well as a place to go and shop. It would be like a destination. And that's why I thought we should look at this again to figure out, can we do this? If so, how can we do it? So it doesn't look like Ford Road. Mm -hmm. So more integration between the uses. Mm -hmm. It should look like it's all it's all compatible and put together, you know, with each type of development, you know, kind of complementing the other development. I think it's like a campus type setting with walking in between and things of that nature in a multi-use 
aspect where you got a little bit of mixture of blending. It's not a hard line, you're blending some stuff, but you got a campus type setting, and, and as, as you mentioned, like where it can be almost an event or a destination for right. place, not just um, a shopping mall. Right, or, right. You know, just not just for shopping. Okay. And then that makes me think when we look at this map. Can, well, can that happen with how we have the um, the uses designated here? And how? I mean, we don't we don't want to plan this area for developers, but we want to provide guidance because, in, in general, like with our with the show stack, you know, how can they fit ten pounds of sugar in a five pound bag? That's what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. They're going to get the biggest bang for their buck, and then. In our community where we live, that's not what we want to look at. That's not that's not what we expect. But when I looked at our master plan, that's what we have. How so the how can we communicate that or, or have our vision communicated in the manner of what these guys are talking about? I, I think as you mentioned, Paul can get more visuals in there, it's cut and paste, you know, this is what we're talking about for this type and this type of as you uh, it mentioned getting some visuals in there. We even, even if we can't overlay over the top of this, but we just like, you know, this is kind of what we were talking about for this area. This is what we're talking about for this area. And, and maybe there's a simply like out there on the internet, there's some pictures depicting <coughs> that type of environment from some other community. You know, that Hamlet and the USD are kind of punched together, and, and there's a lot of common applications for each development. Mm -hmm. You know, the the Hamlet, so a lot of things that could work for the Hamlet would work also for for the USD. And I think that that's one of the things that kind of gets lost in newer development. Um, you have some of these areas like the Hamlet that's grown up organically and seems to function and be very quaint and you know have that traditional neighborhood design. And then when it comes to developing new, we end up with a use here and a use here. And they both have access to the main road, and in order to get between them, you have to drive between them. And you know, you see the example all the time where there may be a school or something uh, in the same block as a neighborhood, but in order to get to the school, parents end up driving their kids a quarter mile or a mile around Absolutely. this block to get to it. So I understand what you're saying. Yeah, if, 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 if our application in the Hamlet and at the USD could give a flavor to Salem, we'll have, you know. Kind of got these, these places that are kind of a destination. You know, they're, local, they're unique. They're not like every other cookie cutter around in the communities around us. We've got something a little bit unique, and I think if we could steer it that way, and I know some of the board members have indicated that they would like to, you know, have a better development, you know, and you would know that, TJ, you know, but, uh, you know, it, to really, you know, make the Salem look like the rural area that it is with these neat little places instead of the average strip mall and the gas station on the end of it. You know, I mean, if we could if we could steer it that way as well as the Hamlet to make it look, you know, like, like you said, not, not not cookie cutter, but a little bit more like a, you know the old style and, and and have some kind of a character to it. So are in you that familiar, regard, are you familiar with Sonoya, Georgia? I am not. It's one, I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, there's more communities that are getting like this, that they <clears throat> created, they created their downtown area um, new with the look of old, like mm -hmm. it had been there for a long time. So they created that, um, just, you know, that's like, and I think there are other communities that are doing that. Mm -hmm. It sounds like that's what yeah. uh, would be nice. Well put. But okay. there are communities around there like that. So I don't know how we could so I think that as part of our plan. Yeah, I mean, certainly for the area that uh, surrounds Godfordson north of M14, um, where there's some development, but it's really ripe for development when utilities are available. Um, maybe thinking about or a concept of that area that's different than the CCP and the ROP, but maybe more of uh, a mixed-use district there with a buffer to the, to the 
neighbors and the existing neighbors might be the most appropriate thing to do there. Um, and I think I understand what the direction is that you're providing in that area. I think that MR in section 26 up to the left is already zoned mm -hmm. multi family, so it'll be a, a matter of ensuring that there's again a buffer to the outside of the district, but then making sure that those are connect there are connections there. Um, so it's not just another auto oriented multi family kind of area. But then I would pose the question um, uh, I guess about the ROP along 14 or the ROP and the RRA on the other side of Godfrey's itself and 14. Um, I think that those are envisioning kind of more of a campus type business office atmosphere. Um, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of market for that right now, but it's really the only area in the community that's kind of preserved for that. So it may be appropriate to kind of keep that the way it is for now um, and see how things kind of go with the, the area that I suspect will be more um, uh, kind of uh, under pressure from development. Um, this stuff could come pretty fast once the utilities are in. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know, I'm sure people holding properties are, you know, kind of looking and... And I know there's been question at the corner of, uh, you know, like Joy and God percent about commercial there, and I think we talked about this, and the answer was no. And so for the time being, those may be very good holding kind of categories. Because um, there's really not a lot of space, not just in, in Salem, but in Washtenaw County, that's preserved for uh, office parks or research parks. Um, and those things kind of ebb and flow, depending on the market. Sure. And that, that ebb has been quite a while since we've seen Right, you know, those industrial parks or office parks being a really high development commodity. They were they really developed rapidly for a while. Mm -hmm. is, it, developed. is it is it normal to have so much residential in an urban services district? When you when you look at this with the UR one, um, the MR. Well, by and large, the UR one that's in section twenty five is kind of filled out. That to change, um, you know, those there are a couple of private roads there and some larger lot of residential pieces. Um, the URL twos are both already zoned for that multifamily district, um, so I think we'd be hard pressed to change that. Um, and and yes, if you do have a commercial or a mixed use commercial area. You do want to have some residents there to support those, to make those areas viable. I was just wondering if this was the common setup for the for the uses, but kind of proportionally, or if something was out of proportion from your from a planning perspective. Um, you know, again, it goes back to this question of how things grow up organically versus you know having these green fields. Um, I think that you know the development that we're looking at. In 36, the corner of Napier and Joy, the Salem Springs is, is being sought after as more of a, a, a bedroom kind of community because of the proximity to um, the highway access. Um, and that is what it is right now. Uh, I think that it, it, it's possible to, to draw those connections between a single family residential neighborhood and kind of a more of a urban um, hub like this. Um, I think that if we had, had had the time to think about how we wanted to make those connections, we could have done some stronger pedestrian connections and bicycle connections to, to allow for this to be a little integrated a little bit better. But um, for the time being, you know, this development's obviously moving forward um, with quite a few houses, but it's in relative proximity to a planned area for commercial uses. So it's, it's normal to have, okay. have a residential district of that density close proximity to more of a kind of a urban commercial center. Um, 14 is kind of the hard part because it creates that buffer between them. Um, so we will, I think, as a community at some point have to look at how do we make that connection that's not just vehicular across the M14 bridge. Okay, thank you. Any other
suggestions, Augie? No, I'm just looking at the uh, research section. I, I, I just don't understand why <clears throat> those two can't just be incorporated. The ROP and the RRA. Yeah, I mean, they're very similar. Yeah, they're similar. Mm -hmm. And then we're talking, you know, if we're talking visually, they're probably going to be similar. I, I'm a proponent of uh, making ordinances simpler and condensing uh, districts. Sure. Is that something that everybody feels? Yeah, and, and, and you know, on, on the map it's stated as uh, research and research applications, and in the write up it's research and technology. What it's for. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think we mind if Google on that. Right. Or Amazon. <laughs> one, one of the things that we're doing um, in kind of a trend in planning right now is, is focusing on the kind of form of the area and recognizing that the uses, albeit you want to make sure you keep out some really obnoxious uses or noxious uses. For, um, but recognizing that the difference between you know a light industrial application or research application or office building are not all that dissimilar and if you design the site to be buffered from neighbors to provide for appropriate parking and accessibility they're going to function very much the same depending on no matter what use goes on so i you know, appreciate that because there's going to be a lot of pop-ups that's that's the whole motor vehicle industry keeps going. We see more and more of that. And it yeah, and it keeps you from then having vacant buildings if you're not precluding a particular use. Mm -hmm. And on uh, that same thought process though, how do we kind of make sure that the the ROPs are more of a buffering, you know, a couple more on more of a buffer zone right now. Um, just, you know, again, because you mentioned there could be a great diversity between an automotive research that's bringing in things to be tested and worked on versus, you know, quite doctor's office or some sort of uh, laboratory facility or things like that. So particularly in, up on or territorial, mm -hmm. uh, even though you kind of already got a restaurant there, you know, the thing that probably not going to change anytime soon, but if it was to be a change, like it's being consistent with a nice a buffering zone rather than something a little more industrial. So I, I think your key areas for, for buffers are going to be along here, <laughs> along here, along the existing neighboring area, you know, neighborhood areas here. Um, this, like you said, is already pretty well developed. The folks who are moving into, you know, this area already understand this so my suggestion a moment ago was that you maybe take oh, right. this whole piece and kind of make it one right. something or other. And then just make sure that, you know, as the development comes to the edge of these areas, we ensure that they're appropriate for the buffers. Um, I think we have some natural existing buffers here. If we can kind of write that in as an overlay or something, we can ensure that, <clears throat> you know, we either maintain existing buffers or create buffers to provide that protection? My kind of question is more how we protect, back to Dan's written, how we protect ourselves to, to make sure that as we see something a little bit slightly different in one area versus another, that we try and steer as best as possible the development for these areas so that there's not the, the, the wrong end of the spectrum of that particular type of Development, yeah, going into the you know, In other words, you're better on this side of the railroad track than that side of the railroad track for that particular development. Um, I, I think that we do that through a, a discussion in the master plan, but then when we get to looking at the zoning ordinance, where you really get the regulations in place, okay. that's where you. So that was my question. Do we have a place to to, to overlap these? Which I had written down a number of comments and some of them are already discussed and that's always something to review them. But one of the things that I wanted to try and ask is if we could look at 
in, and maybe it's not the place to put it, but language is tied for reference to language is such as what I'm most familiar with is uh, uh, USGBC, neighborhood development, or USGBC as far as the land, uh, uh, the water we use, some of the, the, the key points that we, all the developments going there are at least a minimum of a particular, uh, if it's a step higher than what our current uh, building requirements are for back to the, because I've seen it written in here in, in, in words, but you want to reduce and be careful of over storm flow and things mm -hmm. like that, you know, too much storm flow and how we design our retention basins so they're usable properties, not just fence off areas and things of that nature. It's all very well organized even from the beginning and then several upgrades that you put in there were, were really good. But it's like I picked up on those reading through there from my background and how do we make sure that there's a reference in there that a developer goes, oh yes, I gotta incorporate all these rules. Well, so that's, um, I don't know if you noticed, in that stormwater section, uh, there's a whole piece that I actually marked out. And the comment that uh, I added there um, said that this belongs in the ordinance. Okay. In the master plan. Okay. So the master plan is the area where we set up these policies, just as you say, it references all these things and says this is what we expect to see. But then the next step is the implementation step. So after you adopt this, then we go look at the zoning ordinance or the engineering standards, and we say, okay, well, here's the point where we're going to require um, these standards or that they meet the USG, US GBC standards. And just a reference standard that is, uh, it shows that we're progressive looking towards protecting our, obviously our water region, yeah. our areas and things of that nature, as well as making sure that the land that it uses to do that is usable or visually appealing. And actually we're in a uh, progressive county in that uh, we are. Water Resources Commissioner's Office um, has recognized low impact design techniques as being appropriate, so they've, they've moved from some of the just hard crunching numbers for stormwater volumes looking at using uh, infiltration basins and um, uh, you know, uh, vegetative buffers and these kind of things as part of the stormwater management uh, policy. So we can reference the county standards, but we can go even beyond that and say these are other things we would expect. So we do some of that already in the zoning ordinance with the requirements that um, tension ponds be landscaped and be more consistent with stormwater area, the intent being that it would, would mimic more of a, a wetland or something like that. It's, uh, nature takes care of our stormwater. Uh, and it, it becomes more, well, I mean, it's in the eye of the holder, but it becomes more aesthetically pleasing and more consistent with natural surroundings. And, and while I feel comfortable with you and your firm on, on board here, is there enough language in here to um, as development get proposed to watch that uh, one of the comments I made was like sidewalks and bike trails, which has gotten a little bit of, you know, pushback, but where appropriate, as you talk about for connectivity and things like that, but, you know, if you say, well, you know, you got to get a 15% green space and so much sidewalk space and, you know, those are the kind of things that people are trying, from a developer standpoint, hit a number so they create the sidewalk that goes across the main road, mm -hmm. it's eight foot wide, and it's used by three people during the day at best because it goes, you know, nowhere. nowhere important. It doesn't bring you in and around the, you know, the areas that you need to walk. It's not a path that cuts diagonally, you know, so they're always cutting through the grass diagonally, so they're putting the path on the diagonal across mm -hmm. the, the appropriate area. So, you know, again, watching that, we're not just meeting the numbers, but these, as you've stated clearly in this number of times, that they're appropriate and make sense. And, you know, add value, not just meet um, meet the required number of square feet of something. And and then the other uh, couple of comments I had, and again, just help me out with my education, is 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 there a way to a kind of consolidate or condense this? So <coughs> as, as we look at projects, we know that it has to meet these bullet point criteria. And then the second half of that question is who's watching the store that whatever we've proposed here is being followed through right to the, the end and it doesn't get lost somewhere 
in the either building or anywhere else that gets lost along the way or overlooked so that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't get included in and now the development's already in place. So progressively from the from the master plan, the the ideal is that you, you adopt these this language as policy and you put in the appropriate maps, graphics, language to uh, present the policies that you want. You know, oh, yes, yeah, that's great. And then um, if there are changes then that are needed to the zoning ordinance, which is the legislative piece, then we make those changes to ensure that, you know, our conversation about ensuring that bike paths or sidewalks are functioning, not just needing a number, um, we, we put that into the, the requirements then. And then we, as your planners, review the plans that come through, we present that information to you, and then it's up to the planning commission to ensure that the site plan uh, gets passed with those appropriate pieces per this legislation, the zoning ordinance. <coughs> then when it comes to the installation, then yes, the builders are, uh, the building official, and the inspectors are making sure that the buildings are built appropriately according to those approved plans. And then we are planning them, and the engineers are doing inspections to ensure that the roadways, the sidewalks, the pipes, and all those things are then being installed appropriately. For the plan. So the plan becomes then the binding document. So once that's approved by the planning commission, that becomes the binding document that the developers are then responsible for itself. Because that makes me feel a little better, but um, from a, a, a backup plan, if you will, um, I've seen things that you know were brought up as contentious and whatever that were problematic for certain residents here. Yet there's language already here in some of the stuff that as I'm learning and reading, and it's here. It's just I haven't read it yet, or haven't seen it yet, and I'm not sure other people have seen it or understand it correctly, but. In light of this type of development, I would think it would be appropriate if we had, if we could reduce this down to some sort of bullet point checklist thing and then an educational yeah, session for all of our, not just the, the planning, but anybody in the office, anybody on the building inspection side, so that we're all on the same same page as we're looking at this stuff. Mm -hmm. it, it would just, in my mind, be a little bit helpful to, um, to try and make sure that everything is is being captured and that we're getting all the thinking that, that's here to represent this table, you know, as part of the plan and that just like to maybe accidentally forgotten or, or overlooked. Mm -hmm. Well, and I agree with you. And um, like I said, when I first started talking about this and I, um, taking this, you know, 20 page document and trying to kind of organize it and make it a little more poignant so that I mean it, it says lots and lots of great stuff and it says it in many different ways and in different places mm -hmm. and and it, it becomes you know kind of hard to organize in your mind even as you read through it um, and so to your point you know getting some bullet points or making sure the policies are very concise I think is is the challenge that we have in front of us with this and use this language as backup to those bullet points right yeah, and so that's that's often um, a, a good strategy is to have some narrative, some discussion, and then reduce it down into bullet points in another section. So sure. um, <clears throat> it's kind of what I'm trying to do with this. Um, I think our conversation tonight has been helpful in providing me some direction because I didn't want to just be spinning my wheels and rewriting things without ensuring that I was kind of on the same page as all of you with the direction. Okay, and would it be, um, probably that should take up so much time, would it be appropriate to have for peace of mind anyway, the development probably take that position anyway, but maybe have aggregate maximum densities for this area or somehow put maximum numbers so that overall the space can't get greater than X. With too much of this or too much of that or too many residents. So, Again, referring to density, that maybe, and I, I kind of seen that somewhere that there was a thought process of like only 1,500 residents addresses within mm -hmm. that district. So, if, if there's a way, if it's appropriate to put something like that in there, maybe it's in the ordinance, like you said, it's worth a long time here. Well, we can certainly provide more specific direction in the master plan that would then 
make that translation to the ordinance easier. Um, again, this is policy, but we can we can be as as descriptive as we want to with what each of these districts should be based on our vision for the area. Okay, and then um, I don't the last item, but just from a, a probably doesn't belong here, but it looked like you were picking up on some of the language, but more importantly, the, the ongoing maintenance and, and whatnot of it. Again, particularly as it relates to a lot of the planting, we talk about the green space as a native mm -hmm. uh, planting and things like that, but um, is there, as in with the driveway, the private road, private drive, uh, a way of designating that not only does the developers have to, assuming that the developers have to make this look pretty, they have to keep it that way and maintain this space and not let things get either poorly maintained pavements or uh, overgrown um, uh, landscaping, things like that nature. So, so it maintains itself because, again, you stated in here multiple times that you, you want to have a tied together development, not just hodgepodge, and mm -hmm. that's part of it. It's all maintainable and it also um, draws more people of the same mind. So I think we can make a property. A maintenance statement is a policy statement. Point of information. You know, you articulated in, in uh, 1015 about the utilities and all of that. And then I, I was just curious, going back to research and technology, you state under policies number three, public sanitary sewer service would be required. Why was that specifically put in that policy and not the other policies? Um, okay, so I'm, at, I'm looking at 1015 public utility policies and then. And then I go go to the the actual research and technology under the bullet points of uh, policies. Okay. You state public sanitary sewer service will be required. Well, I'm just curious why that's stated in that policy and not in any of the others. And should it then be inserted to all the others, or should it be removed from this one? It's a fair point. Um, I. Don't know. That is a section that I had not updated. Um, so if you look at the areas where the changes have been made, I didn't really make okay. any changes to any of these individual districts yeah, or policies of them. Yeah. Um, but I will take that under advisement as I have to do this on it, for sure. Yeah. You just don't want to flush in that nuclear stuff there. Well, I don't. Right. I mean, I, I think any of the densities that we're discussing. I think you're right. Any of the densities that we're discussing in this area sure. would would require. Right. Sure. So I don't know why it says it. Yeah. Anymore, yeah. Not others. Right. I have a question. The word "will" doesn't mean much. It should say, it should say "shall." Shall. Yeah. Other kind. Of, are the developers are run right over? Do we need to put anything in the master? Well, we want to put something in the master plan about so it doesn't look like tenement buildings or whatever goes in there. To just, so I think that that could yeah, very easily issue. turn into like we just went through URL one a, a density issue. Uh, a present, you know, the aesthetic issue. Yeah, we can do some design discussion in that section. Okay. We tried to avoid that with shell stack on the multiple dwellings as opposed to, to single condos. We got them to get rid of those multiple units and go with the single condos. And, and I agree, I really agree with your, your point on that. Having it look like tenement 
yeah. buildings and that. I really agree with that. There has been some discussion in the past on that, about worrying about that that area, what's going to happen there. So tell me um, what you think about uh, height restrictions <coughs> for either the commercial buildings or multifamily buildings. I think that uh, just in, in specific reference to the multifamily buildings, most developers in areas like this are doing two, three stories at the most. Um, a lot of the product that they're putting out there uh, does have some articulation to it. So there are decks and different roof lines. Some of the single story multifamily buildings that I've seen are less than desirable. They end up being, you know, just eight units in a row, yeah. all dominated by garages. Yeah, South Island has some examples of that. Yeah, and so that's really just a, a kind of going after these folks, empty masters who are leaving their larger homes, people are living longer, they you know have a certain fixed income for a certain amount of time, and they found this niche spot where right. they can right. charge as much as they can for these things right. without charging too much, and make them out of the shoddy materials as right. possible. South Lion is a bad case example in you know, an application. I think we need to find some kind of balance on this multiple residence dwellings that it doesn't look like hodgepodge apartments or, you know, like you say, sprawling one of the buildings. We need to have some, some way of making that in the concept that we've been trying to articulate tonight about having it be more upscale in appearance more compatible with the other areas around it like you know like Bruce was saying you know they have compatibilities and you can you know they, everything complements one another and so I would think these buildings we don't want a bunch of odd apartments standing out and doesn't seem to fit with the rest of the you know. well you don't have any apartments over there to begin with right. so what's going to be out about them other than they, they will stand out yeah. against houses right. and businesses I just but uh, they don't have to be ugly no, but I'm just looking. Can uh, keep it to a two-story? I don't know what the fire department. Uh, I, how high they? I think three-story might be a max for our our current fire mm -hmm. department. Uh, I hate to see it go too high because then it looks ridiculous because it's not for that area. But uh, uh, I, I understand what you say that like South Line north of the railroad tracks here that on the west side of Pontiac Trail oh, yeah. and they all have those little chicken coops on the back hey, exactly. with a metal yep. roof on the back of right. the porch. You know, and it just, you know, those it don't look right. It look, yeah. Yeah. I think the problem that I have a lot better than I can bring you out by the The income yeah. type house. But, um, it, it, you know, architecture is the answer. Even at Somewhere nine miles, you got to find a way to identify some kind of architecture that was fit into the rest of the stuff. And, and there is a lot of there is a lot of uh, uh, possibilities that way to look. You know, we've seen apartment houses that look like tenement housing, and we've seen apartment houses that almost look like stately manors or whatever. You know, there is a big yeah gamut between the looks. So I don't know how we can identify that. And then the amount of, the amount of stories is critical. You know, do we want to go three stories or? Can, are we able to get away with two stories? I don't know. You know, I don't know what, you know, what rights zoning-wise those. I wouldn't want to see one story. Uh, no, no, for but apartment, I'm yeah, uh, right, right, right. Uh, it, but do you want to go three? That's what I. I know two is probably you know. If the I'm only looking at the fire department's end of it. If they say three story is no problem, then that's no problem. We could go to that point, but no higher. Yeah. They got a nice development. North Territorial and Plum Township, and it's a, at least condos in there that are two story. And boy, they really have yeah, the architecture and everything's really nice on them. You know. We might go to Royal Oak and look at something there, but I'm, in my mind, I'm picturing like a brownstone type building or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dearborn yeah. has that. Dearborn has yeah, that. Dearborn has yeah, Dearborn has put in all new. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, so like I said before, before, there are three story buildings um, yeah. where they, they do do a good job of making. Single-family residential in nature, and there's some distance between yeah. the units, uh, you know, horizontally and vertically. Um, TJ, to answer your question, um, we can make a statement that says that we want to see articulation in the roof line. We can 
make a statement that says that we don't want to see uh, garage dominated fronts of buildings. And then when we get to the zoning ordinance, we can be even more specific about how we expect that to be. You know, 50% of them have to have you know, garages that are obscured by you know, what have you, or that you know, a minimum yeah. of, if you get a certain number of units, you have to have uh, different roof lines or something like that. So we can certainly do that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that um, just in, in, in your, the three of your discussion about the building height, the products that I've seen that go up to three in, in most of our um, single family residential, residential can go up to like two and a half. Mm -hmm. um, they end up doing the garage on the first floor with like a half level, and then they've got a second floor where kind of the main living area is, and then they have bedrooms on the third. But the, the design of those things tends to be a lot of things. You, you, you bring up the thing about uh, garages facing the front. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, what's the possibility of doing it? Well, all the fronts of the house are down the main street and back here. This is the back door of the garage and it's, yeah. I hate to use the word alley, but it's the no. back street. Yeah. Yeah, right. And then the yeah. units here at the back of these units face that street. Yeah. So every, the, the privacy of going in and out of their own garage is that street nobody else actually would be using. Yeah. 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 But the yeah. Rent, yeah. renters or whomever. Yeah, and the, the trick really is, um, and there's well, it's not that it's fine. I mean, rear, rear entry garages are great. The trick is making sure that um, you don't end up with the front being the alley. So oftentimes these developments will happen where they design them knowing that they have to have these front yards, but then they just have this little grassy corridor between buildings and become no man's land because they're just mm -hmm. the place. They've got some developments in Canton. South end where the garages come in from the side, you know, they're they're back, but people still the, the garage from the front and the back because that they may be a street back with buildings. They don't want to be facing garages, yeah. so the, the 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 garages are are designed so that they are set back, but they come in through the side. And you can do something with little knee walls and vegetation. Right. So that, that kind of parking exactly. area is yeah. a little bit obscure because yeah. the building is generally facing the road and you have a sidewalk. Because in front of the building, you have a little brick wall, you know, four feet high or five feet high. Or whatever. Seven, <coughs> seven points with the whole side. Yeah. Um, my it's main thing I actually for this Sorry. whole yeah. thing is Gofferson Road. At one time, I think several years back, when, uh, if I'm not mistaken, we were hoping that would turn into a boulevard type road. Mm -hmm. That way then I'm, I'm looking at it that it would alleviate a lot of the curb breaks. If you have a boulevard, then you could take one street that goes down and through the development and back out again. Just want to look at, like we talked about the west side of Gofferson there uh, by the CCPs do the same thing. So it's not all coming out on Gofferson Road and, and then with it being a boulevard, you, you take away the, you know, that traffic. Uh, to me, it, uh, Ford Road needs to be a boulevard. Uh, the, the, like it is, it's getting, uh, it's got more lanes, you know, than ever that was ever thought of, I think, for that road. I think that as, as deep as the CCP district is shown here, you really do have that opportunity to identify a couple of uh, he knows where you might have a cross street. Mm -hmm. So you could have basically side streets superimposed over this and take your access from the side street so you don't have any additional curb cuts on. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I, I hate to see that like we you go through South Line and every business got their own. It's one curb cut at, after another. Mm -hmm. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, how can the uh, their planning commission or anybody else allow something like that because it's ridiculous when you travel down there because it's only a two-lane road you think either through the county the Oakland county should do something with it to alleviate that but they were supposed to which they did uh, Griswold they were supposed to do uh, the same with uh, oh what's the street down the boundary for us on the west uh, Dixboro mm -hmm. that was supposed to be for the people that are pass-throughs. Mm -hmm. Use those two roads to go north and south and then stay off of the main 
Pontiac Trail if you're unless you're going to the one of the businesses. <coughs> but that never never transpired for them. And of course, well, they got one part of it done, but they never got the west end of it done. And I hate to see something like that turn into Gofferson Road, yeah. and then all of a sudden decide let's widen it, let's make a left-hand turn lane, and pretty soon you're getting a lot of cement there. Well, once you do those turn lanes, you know if you have a a, a, a taper, if you will, for every one of those curb cuts, then all of a sudden you can't have any pedestrians walking along. Right, because the space between drives becomes so uh, not pedestrian friendly. So I think that's a great point. Yeah, see, and I look at, at this property here, the ROP that's north of M14. They don't go out to Gofferson Road, so somehow there's got to be a, a street that's going to affect them other than Napier. Mm -hmm. So, but that I look at that. That's all residential there. And would you uh, want traffic to load up on Napier Road? I don't really think so. When the freeway is over here and the entrance is over on the west end of it. And that very well could be done in there with a, a circle type road and, and make that the uh, residential office part. And uh, to me, because it buffers right up against the, the residences as it is that live to the north side there. You're talking about the ROP that's on 14. Right, yeah. okay. right. That way, that these people that live there now, they're not going to be looking at, uh, uh, even if it's RRA, the box type. That you see down on M14 there by uh, in Plum Township uh, and in Dex Road, you're not seeing those block uh, square block buildings. You're, you're going to see something that looks similar to a home, you know, if they build them that way. Uh, and and I I can see that you can make sidewalks in there real easy with lighting, and then make that appealing to the eye, especially for the people that live to the north. But I, I see. I can't see how they're going to get out to to Gafferson Road or somewhere. Uh, either the, you know north, you're going through the residential area, and I don't think with that there that should go through the residential area. But any roads be connected to to their streets. Gotcha. But we don't have too much say over that. I know that's all township uh, that does roads. But I thought maybe, you know, if we can input, have our input looked at, you know, this is how we feel something might look at. Yeah, I mean, if, More appealing. if we have policies, you know, relating to roads and connectivity and pedestrian access, vehicular access, uh, in our in the master plan that when the road commission or MDOT or anybody's doing road projects, they have to consider, based on state statute, what it says in the local plan. Mm -hmm. So getting that kind of language into this, uh, even a conceptual design, I think, would be very good. Um, these the, the private, the existing residents in this area are all on private roads. So unless there's some desire to create some connectivity mm -hmm. here, nobody's going to be forced to do anything like that. See, what I don't want to see is too is a straight line road where it's uh, a drag strip for people to, when they're leaving work to get the heck out of there and fly to get, get home. To sit in a chair and do nothing. <laughs> but uh, you know, if you see them kind of whining, they can't. You know, uh, 25 is the speed limit. That's 25 is what they get to do. Yeah. Because the, the road road design won't allow them to go any faster. I think that's all really good input that, that helps give me direction as to where we want to go. Are there other comments or thoughts, things you want to share? Yeah. Has there been any, anyone coming in lately requesting any of these to be rezoned? Okay. I haven't, I haven't seen anything yet. Okay. I've heard throughout the years of some you know, wanting to turn some of these into residential and they really worry about supposed to be houses and I hate to see this whole area become nothing but a bedroom community. Mm -hmm. And then in, in your opinion of uh, looking at other similar areas, um, 
is there enough of the commercial commons areas to provide the, the local commercial needs of this many houses? There's just, there's a lot of like this office park and stuff. But, I mean, is, is that the areas that are the CCP, is that enough for like meeting those some of the needs of the people in the area. I think there's probably enough to meet the, the local commercial needs. Mm -hmm. I don't think that you're going to meet the regional commercial needs. I think that some of these folks right. are still going to be driving to right. the, the Walmarts or the Myers or something like that. But mm -hmm. what I understand is that that's not what we're looking for in this area. That's not what we want. That's right. what we get. So um, I think from a, a local commercial perspective, in, in terms of having something that's a a walk of the destination or a drive in a couple blocks to get to a restaurant or something like that. Right, yes. yes. Okay. Speaking of rezoning, if somebody wants to rezone something, and I guess that's all the rage these days, um, and it, how do we, is, is that what we do in can we put something in the master plan in regards to is, is that does it say our expectations of like the, this balance is what we have is what we're looking for so somebody wants to come and say well let's turn this and let's turn it you know and then all of a sudden it's all residential how do we protect ourselves from that by sticking to your plan so if, okay. you, have, if you have a future land use plan that says we designate this area okay. it, may be, it may be zoned agricultural right now but we designate this as you know commercial uh, commercial commons or whatever whatever term we, we give that for the local commercial area and somebody comes in and says well now i want to do residential we say well no our policy says this and then you deny that you recommend a denial of that rezoning to the board and the board upholds your recommendation um, you have the backing based on your policy based on your ordinance to say that they can't push you, you know, they can't push you to do something that's not in the plan. I just was thinking that like with this 26 here, the multi, multiple family residential who said, well, to get the biggest bang of our buck, we need to rezone this ROP over here too, or or part of something else. Well, yeah, <laughs> no, so your, what they want, your plan you know? doesn't call for it. And yeah. if you set the precedent that says we stick to our plan and we don't, yeah, exactly, we don't do, you know, okay. we don't deviate from this, then that gives you a, a defensible right. decision making. Okay, it, it, that's the idea of USD. It's really, you know, to protect us from a tax on our zoning. Mm -hmm. You know, really, basically, because we've got. A plan and it's laid out and this is where we want the multiple dwellings um, the rest of the stuff is zoned differently and there's a, that was all part of our plan and if we didn't have the USD then we would have a hard time defending ourselves against other zoning attacks because the government's going to say well where are your multiple units where's your P, you know PUD type thing you know I mean, so it's kind of been thought of that this was a like a protection for the township that this is where we'll have the development near the expressway, and the rest is going to, we hope, to remain somewhat rural. Well, you, you are, yeah, you're providing for these other types of uses. So you're providing mm -hmm. for a variety of uses throughout the township that does provide you some protection. That right. Somebody can't come in right. and say, well, you don't offer this any place. Um, right. I want to do it. And you say, well, nope, we plan for it here. So Absolutely. that's exactly, you're exactly right. Okay. One more thing, Paul. I see. The Gockerton uh, Corridor, uh, the ROPs at, mm -hmm. at North Territorial, which basically most of that land is already commercial, yeah. and it's commercial. Why are we overlaying it for the ROP? I, uh, yeah, that was Should one of my initial questions. Shouldn't that I just think, go CCP? I think that was the answer. Yeah. 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 I did notice that, like, what's there is not ROP. Yeah. I, I, I like that people pay construction companies who remove big rocks from their land so and then they sell, sell them in there. <laughs> <laughs> the business you can get into there. Yeah. Rock, rock shop something. Yeah. Anyone else have any questions here for Paul? Comments, suggestions, quick grand ideas? I think you got a good idea. I think the suggestions were good. 
I know some people in the audience, so I think Bob had a question, and I put him on hold a long time ago. <laughs> Thank you. Just a couple things uh, real quick. Even though there's a zoning map, uh, to get back to that uh, changing of uh, uses and, and, and zoning, a petitioner can still uh, file to the ZBA to try to get a zoning change, right? No. And that's not at all. No. No zoning changes. No. They can ask for dimensional variances. They can't ask for use variances. Just in Salem Township? No, anywhere. If, if uh, rezoning, is not uh, under the purview of the ZBA. So within a zoning district, the an applicant could ask for a variance from the requirements of that zoning district. Or they would, if they wanted a zoning change, they would go to the planning commission then? Yes. Yes, because yep. I just went through this in Livonia where a home I had was, well I had it was office services, mm -hmm. and the new owner has changed it down and got permission to go residential, part okay. one. So that's through the planning commission. Correct. Well, okay. ultimately through the board. All right. The next question was that MR, that multiple family residential, mm -hmm. I'm sure this scenario wouldn't happen, although I've seen them located two blocks from Lake Michigan and never figured it out. But what would stop a developer from putting in a equal opportunity community, low income apartments in that MR? Um, we don't. The ordinance doesn't regulate regulate the ownership model, um, so multiple family means that multiple residential units are attached. So they could go. They could go in there. They could be theoretically. Um, they could be condos that are sold outright. They could be uh, rentals that are rented at any scale. Okay. All right. uh, off of Ten Mile, South Lyon, <clears throat> some beautiful homes in there, and they've got some apartment. The government mandated to the builder that some of those homes would go to welfare families, mm -hmm. even though they're nice, beautiful homes. Right. And same thing with some of the uh, apartment units. The government comes in and says, this is what we want. And I think the builders acquiesce. I've seen it two blocks from Lake Michigan up yeah. north. Yeah, yeah. Figure it yeah. Out. they do it. Beautiful just, location. It's, it's that, okay. That's the new world. This probably yes. wouldn't happen, yeah. but that yeah. is a scenario yeah. that yeah. that's a possibility. Yeah. You look you look at all the you know the development going on in Detroit and you hear about these guys building these wonderful new residentials. Part of those residentials are for section eights. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 So you know yeah. somebody could yeah. be somebody could be buying a quarter million up here and then somebody could be moving into a fifty thousand so, yeah. Mr. Hartman, comment? I, I don't think we've taken into, I mean, we're talking about Salem, but I don't really think we've taken into the, what's going on in Plymouth and in Northville. As of October the 15th, uh, they're going to develop almost a thousand acres of the Oakland's property. And part of the, where the prison was is going to be light industrial, and the rest of it is going to be technology and research. Uh, they're proposing in Plymouth to be four six to eight thousand jobs plus the people coming and going there's going to be ch child care there's going to be restaurants and i want to know where all that traffic is going to go when it leaves there if it goes it's not going to go to the back it's going to go to Patterson, and it's going to go towards salem so what do we you're talking about Patterson road it's going to be a racetrack and wouldn't, that tra wouldn't that traffic be going mostly east, though, and not yeah, west? I mean, six to eight thousand jobs. Yeah, it, in the, the yep. support for it and all this stuff that's going in on the corner <coughs> down there. Well, well, you know, it hit like Jack and Sheldon hit the expressway there. So. But it's M fourteen. Yeah, and people find the easiest route. Well, there isn't a lot of traffic <laughs> from the development <laughs> just east of there. You know, the Toll Brothers development, have a big mm -hmm. development over there with golf courses and everything. Yeah, that right. hasn't really bought a lot of traffic this way. They're, they're going to start right at Napier Road and go that way. They yeah. cleared that whole Georgia's farm out there. They, that, that, <laughs> that, that, <laughs> There's got to uh, stick on that property. That, um, property was, uh, there was a problem with it being polluted. I have never heard. They're going to they, they're, they're they're develop it. Actually, the 27th of September is a walk around. And the developers and, and the, the, the people that are going to sell it have to have their paperwork in by October 15th, and they say total build out in two years. 
Hmm. It's because they, you know, Detroit owned the property and the developer came in and they had a kind of a tentative deal, but then the developer backed mm -hmm. up because of the cost of cleanup of that property. Yeah, but let's the, let's the, get back let's get back to ours. ours. Yeah, but we're something to cons traffic. consider is is the traffic. Um, it's a good point. In about three years. Yeah, that should kind of be built. We need our roads all dirt. <laughs> then nobody will want to come this way. Traffic is going to increase. There's no doubt about it. And they go 55 miles an hour now, 5 miles in the afternoon. Uh, Mr. Walsey. Yes. Uh, back to the uh, the current land use map in the uh, current master plan. When that current land use map was established, there was a great deal of strategies put together to make sure that there were compatible land uses not only within the district but also outside the district. I think you're all aware of that. And the ROP was uh, specifically put in strategic places within uh, the land use map to provide transitional buffering uh, for different portions of the USD. What's really key to it, not only for within the district but also outside the district. So it's to really to really appreciate this map, I think it needs to be expanded to see how the URL 1 of the established residential district, the, uh, the current established residential district, provides a perfect compatible zoning for the residents across the street to the north of North Territory. And the ROP, which was rezoned by the administration, not the, not the current administration, but the previous administration, and the specific reason that they rezoned that was to provide uh, compatible zoning to that URL 1 district. You remember they went to uh, the court battle there for a, during a referendum and all that. And there's a conservation easement there as well. You may want to incorporate additional conservation easements to create uh, compatible zoning and buffering throughout, throughout the district. And with all due respect, uh, uh, Ms. Merlo made a comment about possibly there may be too much Residential, she had a concern for an urban services district. Well, I hope she's not speaking about the established URL 1 district because there's uh, 35 homes there. Because if you remember that this administration already approved a 558 home development, so I think that question should have been posed prior to the approval of that development and taken took into consideration the established residents at that time. So to try to change the plan, the residential district, after approving a 550 home development, I think would be completely inappropriate at this, at this time. Uh, the, uh, there was some other discussion about the, uh, uh, well, this conservation easement, let me ask you about this, this conservation easement on the other side of the, uh, the district. Is this something that the, uh, the Planning Commission is uh, uh, considering at this time, that, that large parcel there on the north side of, uh, or the south side of M-14? Is this the one that's just north? It's just south of, uh, the south one is already Hill, and then the church on top of which is kind of boxed in. So, so a large portion of that is already exact conservation easement. So that's Correct. why we showed it that way. Mostly what already conservation. And I spoke to a planner years ago about developing an urban services district. And he said the challenge is, is most of the time when you're developing the USD, you don't have a blank slate to work in. And that's the case in Salem Township because you have a lot of established uses within that district. So it's appropriate to make uh, compatible uses and accommodations for the people that live within in that district. And it sounds like you're on that path, and I, uh, I appreciate that. So, and I also appreciate the fact that we're talking about staying consistent with the plan, and that's what troubling to me is you've already varied from the plan by changing the zoning from research and research application to URL 1 that shows that gas for. So how, how do you now maintain the integrity of the rest of the district 
if you give somebody a rezoning on a piece of property and you've already varied from your plan. some education on this is, is again maybe um, and I agree with what you're saying or understand what you're saying because if you vary then it opens the door for other people to try and drive away from that but if we are uh, if we rewrite this plan and dig our heels in we have a better fighting chance especially if we stick to it and that's why I think we're trying to be very concerned about the language and the tightness of the language so that we don't allow somebody to drive that mad truck through that little hole that we have in our language Appreciate that. Am I correct though the township did rezone it one parcel that was it was actually agricultural residential and it rezoned it to uh, to residential uh, a denser zoning and but the township plan called for it to be research and research application. So we did vary from the township plan that was outlined in the master plan, correct? Madam Chair, I would suggest yeah. that if nobody specifically recalls this that you don't uh, yeah, I, I can't remember any details. Okay, yeah, one other thing. Uh, this URL 1 off of North Territorial Road, that is still, you know, I've heard board meetings where they're trying to negotiate lesser density for that development, trying to have more of a bigger lives. Yeah, the, the, this, I think you're yeah. talking about URL 2. Yeah, the corner of Territorial and... Uh, oh, yeah, 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 you're right, you're right. I, I, I said that. Well, yeah, that part there, they're looking for, you know, less density, you know, but it, so it's, it's not, it's not set in stone yet on that, right. even though they've got a big sign up there. Yeah. It's already been rezoned for that, if I'm not mistaken. That's already been uh, zoned a greater density than URL, too. Yeah, I don't know, you know, I don't know, I'm not aware, yeah. you know, of the rezoning, I'm not aware. And also the planner made a that suggestion to you, too, that possibly, that uh, you may want to reconsider the ROP at some time due to the fact that there may not be a market for that. Remember too, what I've always read and been told, and just a suggestion, is that uh, remember you allow developers a reasonable use, everybody a reasonable use for their property, not the greatest use for their property. The developers spe are speculators. Sometimes they win, sometimes they lose. It's up to the townships create a plan, a defensible strategy that's in the best interest of the township. Not in the best interest of the developers, but of the township. Thank you. Um, okay, a couple things. Thank you, Mr. Wazi. I don't recall you saying you want to change something from this to that yet. Did, did, did that happen? I mean, I know we talked about consolidating things or making it simple, but we haven't... You haven't been involved what it, that we haven't you haven't said involved. what it was. I is think that, no, I think my, my question was what saying, then. well, my, my question was about the appropriateness of these areas, and I think through our discussion we suggested that it's probably appropriate to uh, maintain these because they are some of the only areas in the township that are planned for those particular uses, and even though they may not be particularly marketable at this time, it's appropriate to hold those. Spots in those okay. So does that clear things yeah. up? Okay. Yeah, that's what he said. They may they may not be marketable at this time. I, I remember. But you said he he, was, he he recommended changing it. And he didn't do that. It was part of the discussion, and then it was. No, I said he may recommend changing it possibly in the future because he said it may not be marketable at this time. Right. And another thing, um, in regards to the, I I don't. I don't recall any details. I remember there being a change, but I don't remember when, where, why for the URL, so I can't come on in yet. But as far as you said that I wanted to all of a sudden change the density, what I asked him I didn't say was, you wanted but, to can it. you just let me finish, please? Okay. I what I asked the question was, was this a normal proportion? And the reason that I, I even asked Paul to review this is because of 
the way the URL one and the show stack development was happening. It was happening in a way that, you know, I know this is all, they said, oh, well, this is planned, here's the vision. But there were a lot of things that we, that the vision, our vision did not come through in the master plan. And so, and I don't mean our vision, I mean our vision, the Salem one, is in regards to the density, in regards to what it's gonna look like, in regards to the quality. So that's why I suggested that we revisit this. And then my question was, is this normal proportion in regards to density, um, residences, and things of that nature? I'm not trying to say, oh, I screwed up. Go ahead and try and fix it and you know stick it to the next developer. That's that's not that's not the that's case. Not what, that's not what I was implying. Okay, that's you just made, the way it came across. Then. I thought you maybe you made a suggestion that there may be too much residential in that area. That's the way you came across. I didn't say that you made any decision or anything. And I misspoke in regard to the research and research application. It was rezoned and showed when Johnson Controls, Mr. Lewandowski would remember this, when Johnson mm -hmm. Controls came years ago, they rezoned that the research and reset, research and research application, PUD. So the township did rezone that. They rezone that from research and research application, PUD, to residential. So you did. Now you changed our master plan. So the concern again is, is how do you maintain the integrity of the district? once you change the district. And that forward. was also my question. I think we just talked about it a few minutes ago. How do we maintain not changing this? So my concern is the same as yours. Ms. Hamilton. A master plan is a best guess. It's not cast in stone. Right. right. And so Johnson no Controls came forward and said, we want to expand into Salem. And for whatever reason, they decided not to. Not only did they not expand in Salem, but they scaled back in Puma Township. Possibly they foresaw some of the economic decline that we experienced in 2008. The property was rezoned to research research application, but it sat there for 15 years in an area that's called an urban services district, and someone farmed it. Nobody ever intended that that area be farmed once Mr. Penn and his board back in 1998 created the urban services district. There's an argument if your master plan is so far out there that you can't bring in that type of development, it probably needs to be modified, and that's what you've done, and that's what you're working through tonight. We have an area where we say needs to be retail space. I'm kind of interested to see what Showstack does with that. They have development agreements that call for, I think it's 381 or 391,000 square feet of retail space. In an era where brick and mortar buildings are closing, if you saw the news today, Toys R Us now is potentially going to file um, Chapter 11 bankruptcy. And so I'm interested to see you probably, if not you, your, your successors in your chairs will be asked perhaps to modify that retail. And I think it's entirely reasonable and it's very unreasonable to think that a master plan is never going to evolve, it's never going to change. And I appreciate the way that you guys go through this, the care that you give it as you look at how it needs to be changed. Because it does, as our world changes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All righty. We're all good on that then? Yep. Okay. okay. Reports of commissioners and correspondence from Board of Trustees. Anything to report? Um, he did not vote on the shared driveway because there was a lot of other agenda items, so that was put off probably for next month. Okay. CBA, Darrell? Yeah, we had uh, a meeting. Uh, Mr. Horton came in and requested a variance for the north end of his uh, side of his property and the south. Uh, side of his property. The south side was 3.70 uh, feet and uh, the north side is 4.1 and uh, the south side is to extend the building with the overhead crane in it uh, that has been extended before. It's just making it a little, uh, making it longer and the north side is for uh, extending his storage unit so he can get his steel from the outside and put it in the inside. 
in in uh, it passed. There was only three of us here, but it passed, and, and everything's all set for Mr. Horton here. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay. Land preservation and conservation. Nothing, nothing new. Nothing new. Chairs persons. Nothing new. Approval of the minutes for August twenty first, two thousand seventeen. Motion to approve. Okay, go ahead. I'll make a motion to approve the uh, August 21st, 2017 draft minutes as submitted. Second. All those in favor of approving the minutes of August 21st, 2017 as submitted say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Uh, 11 public comments. Mr. Walsey. Last comment regarding the USD, there was a comment just made about how the Johnson controls property sat there for years undeveloped. The reason it sat undeveloped for that many years, it seems, that's just part of a two square mile, approximately 1,400 acre urban services district where there were a lot of large parcels that sat, sat vacant for all those years. I have to remember that entire district was predicated on public water and sewer. So without public water and sewer, none of that district can be developed. So that's the main reason much of the property in the Urban Services District, including the Johnson Controls property, remain undeveloped. Thank you. Okay. Well, there, oops, I'm sorry. Ah. Uh, a couple things. Augie um, was talking about the difference between residential office park and research and research applications. ROP is just offices, but RRA can be research and development. And I mean, some of these research and development places are as big as well, Toyota and Willis, Michigan. I mean, they're huge. They can be plants with forklifts and loading docks and stamping presses. They just don't do production runs. But I mean, I just want to make sure that everyone understands that some research and development centers and prototypes that do prototypes can be great big plants. They just don't do production runs. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I was going to say was uh, I like Dan's idea on Godfordson Road with the commercial. Not everything fronting on uh, Godfordson. Hopefully there will be some streets that run perpendicular to Godfordson where there's businesses down that create more of a uh, village atmosphere. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think in part of your language there, there may not be in the right section to limit some of the uses to excessive noise and odors and all those type of things that might come along with a larger um, development like that. And, and again, to your, to your point, you want to make sure that you continue to show those excluded options. Most people just don't realize that some of these research and development places are as big as they are with all their equipment and I mean they're they're, oh, yeah, they're a plant, but they just don't they just I mean, alone, yeah, I know it. They just don't do uh, production. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Texan, yeah, GM Texan. GM Proving Ground, GM Tech mm -hmm. Center. Okay. Meeting adjourned at eight fifty eight. <laughs> Let me turn on the Yeah, let me shut everybody's <laughs> Sorry, walk everybody. But I guess you have to come on a new side of